Hello, everyone. Welcome to Innovation Coffee, brought to you by ARM. My name is Robert Wolf, and I'm your host today and every day, every week in the past going forward. Uh, we have a good time here talking with amazing people from around the world about all things ARM tech. And so today we have a very interesting guest uh, known as Wrong Bod on Twitter. Maybe you are familiar with him. Uh, but we are going to introduce him as Matthew Alt. So Matthew Alt is a software and hardware reverse engineer, and we're going to go over everything reverse engineering today. So there's going to be so much cool stuff. He has some demos for us, and he's going to teach he's going to teach me how to be a reverse engineer, and you too. There's some cool courses out there that he's going to share with us that you can go follow and that you can go take. And uh, by the end of this episode, hopefully you have all the resources you need to go and explore this world of reverse engineering. Now, before we bring him on, as we usually do, we have some news announcements. So let's cue that. I've been, I've been basically doing this for weeks now. And, you know, uh, Dev Summit, ARM Dev Summit is literally at this point, really, it's really right around the corner. Like next week, I think pretty much or the week after next, it's starting. So, you know, uh, I definitely think that if you are watching this right now and you are not already registered to ARM Dev Summit, you need to go down to devsummit.arm.com. There are a lot of really cool things happening at this event. It is a virtual event. It is free and you can go explore it right now. Now, in fact, just yesterday, they released a whole bunch of on-demand content. And so I'm going to share my screen here real quick to kind of poke through some of this on-demand content that you can go explore right now. Um, oh, did, did I hit, okay, there we go. So um, let's go, let's, cl let's click around here. So this stuff was just released yesterday. You can go to devsummit.arm.com right there, like I said, and you can already start interacting and viewing and participating in some of this cool stuff that's going on uh, uh, at Dev Summit. So one of the things here is the arcade. Um, from what I understand, when you, when you click this arcade, they're going to prompt you in for a uh, possibility for winning prizes. So play before October 22nd for your chance to win. There's, there's sorts of prizes that you can get. There's different types of games that you can already go play. You know, look, thank you for participating. Anyways, I'm not going to go through all of this stuff. I'm more excited to go talk with, uh, with Matthew here that we have as our guest. But I just wanted to kind of point this out. Now, another thing here uh, is the Tech Hub. So under the Tech Hub, if you click that, you'll notice that you can already start clicking on sessions. So I'm going to click on one here, the body post tracking and its applications. So if I click on go to session, you'll see that it takes me to the session and you can already watch it. Okay. So from my understanding, there's lots of other things that are already activated here on demand starting yesterday. Go check it out. You can already watch sessions, get your, get up to speed with some of the cool stuff, or at least get some stuff out of the way so that when Dev Summit, the live stuff comes up, you can start paying attention to that instead. So very cool. Check out armdevsummit.com or devsummit.arm.com. And let me remove this now. Back to me on the big screen. All right. That's that's pretty much it. Um, so go check that out. Right. So let's bring on our guest now. We're joined by Matthew Alt, as I mentioned, a software and hardware reverse engineer. Got to turn my mouth. Uh, Matthew, welcome. How's it going? Hey, Rob. Good. How are you? Good. Thanks. Welcome to Innovation Coffee. Do, do you have any coffee? Is it? I do. I have some right here in front of me all right so. cheers cheers to uh innovation and, <laughs> and coffee um we have uh uh what we usually do here at the beginning of our show right because i'm sure that some people join maybe because of you they might already be familiar with you but some people won't be so i like to go through an origin story uh can you give us your origin story superhero matthew origin story <laughs> superhero i don't know but uh <laughs> yeah so i got started with reverse engineering, actually, I was luckily and lucky enough to get started with it in college. So I went to a small school in West Virginia, where I uh, majored in music for the first two years, decided that wasn't quite going to do it for me. And the summer of my sophomore year, I had rebuilt a 71 Honda CL150 motorcycle and was just completely enamored with the electrical system, like learning how the rectifier worked and all that other stuff just really kind of sucked me in. And so when I went back to school in the fall, I switched to the closest thing my school had to electrical engineering, which was computer engineering. And so um, do a year or so of that. And my junior year, I had a professor who I lifted weights with 
tell me that there was a company that was opening up near a racetrack that needed someone who knew how to solder for an internship. And so I kind of chased down that lead with him and it turned out to be an ECU tuning company. And what that job essentially consisted of at the time was I would, you know, desolder chips from ECUs, put them in a reprogrammer, ship them back out to the customer. The customer would then, you know, the reflash would give them more horsepower, better traction control, what have you. And so I did that for a little while and then they brought me in as a reverse engineer. So then it became my job to reverse engineer uh, things like this, this ECU here and try to figure out, you know, is there a way we can extract data or, you know, reflash the module. And so luckily for me, pretty much every gig I've had since 2010 has been in the reverse engineering realm, whether that be, you know, hardware, software. And uh, yeah, so I went from there I was posting a bunch of side projects on Reddit, and that actually got me in touch with some people at MIT Lincoln Laboratory here in Massachusetts. And so they needed embedded reverse engineers, and I ended up interviewing there and coming up to Boston for four years to work there, which was a lot of fun. And then uh, from there, um, myself and some folks that I worked with left and joined another smaller contractor where we do you know, just various types of embedded reversing and software reverse engineering. And like I said, we're very lucky to, you know, have been given the opportunity to do that for work pretty much full time for quite some time now. And so. Matthew, thank you for sharing your story here. You know, I think it's pretty cool how you started with a motorcycle. Like you can remember, you can remember the moment, right? Like the moment where you said, ah, this is, this is, I think the path I want to take here. And yeah. I, I just think that's awesome. I can remember my moment. I did, I talked about it in one of the pilot episodes of, of this. Um, but, um, you know, to want to become an engineer myself, but this is, this is really cool. Uh, not only that, uh, I will say, uh, you know, the path that you've taken so far is amazing. You know, you're talking about meeting, uh, you know, or deciding on, on where you want to go with a professor that you lift weights with. I literally just, <laughs> I want to show you right now. We're, we're gonna, I literally just put together my weight rack right here. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. I'm waiting for my, my weights and, and, and barbell to show up, but yeah, that's really cool. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing all that. Now, I want to dive into, actually, I want to do a little icebreaker round before we dive into uh, our, our main segment here. So this icebreaker, I already briefed you on it. It's called Innovation Coffee Cribs. So let's queue up the segment. Oh, right. Matthew, you, I already know because you have a whole bunch of cool stuff sitting on your desk there. Let's see what is on or in Matthew's Innovation Coffee Crib. Sure. So the first thing, this is just a, this is a Raspberry Pi on a nice little breakout holder that has a breadboard and things attached to it. And so this is what I use for a hardware hacking course that I teach. This is also kind of my go-to tool for when I first take a look at an embedded platform and forgive the rat's nest of wires. I assume most of our desks look like that. Uh, and then on the other camera, I've got two different projects I've been working on. So this is a, a PCB out of the Namco Museum arcade cabinet that was released about a year ago. And so interestingly enough, this thing runs Android and you'll notice we have you know, this parallel NAND flash here. We've got our main CPU here, some SRAM, et cetera. And, you know, those of you that are looking closely might see that these lines here, which were for an SD card slot beforehand, have all been soldered to to these various breakout cables, because this can actually be repurposed as a JTAG interface for this CPU. And so those of you that have worked with the, the all winner chipset may be familiar with that. And so the current workflow for this is I'm trying to reflash it to play, you know, other ROMs and other games. And I'm about halfway, halfway there right now. And so I've also got a, a PCB here that I've been designing for the Raspberry Pi. It's, it's relatively simple for those of you that do you know, PCB design, but the idea here is to have you know, a level shifter breakout where you've got all of your common embedded interfaces you know, labeled. So we've got you know, SPY, I2C, UART, JTAG, SWD, et cetera. And uh, this will be, might be a little more difficult to view, but I've got a bucket of SSDs that I've been reverse engineering, um, trying to figure out basically, you know, is the JTAG interface active on, you know, this, this SSD, for example, and if so, how can we take advantage of that to maybe reflash the firmware that's embedded in here? And so those are some of the, the side projects that I've got going on at the moment. 
that's really cool. You know, I, I, I will say some, sometimes people have some basic stuff sitting on their desk, you know, a Raspberry Pi here or there, maybe an Arduino. You had some pretty intricate things. I think that's really cool. Um, and, and maybe in a future episode, we can get you to tell us, walk, walk us through all those guitars you have in the background. Too. Oh, sure. Yeah. Looks like all Fenders. <laughs> Yeah, the, well, there's a Charvel and two Fenders. Gotcha, so. gotcha. Cool. Yeah, um, so thank you so much, Matthew, for walking us through that. Now, we've said the words reverse engineer many times now in the first 12 minutes of this show. I, I want to take this into our main segment now and start off with the question, what is a reverse engineer? Yeah, so that's that's a cool question because it's 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 very broad and you know it can range from a lot of folks end up doing reverse engineering and they might not even realize it right let's say you're looking at you were given some pre-compiled shared object to work with some external hardware that you have but you maybe weren't given proper api documentation so you need to figure out how to work with that api right or maybe you're working with an api that you didn't develop and you have to poke around and learn a little bit more about how it works in order to properly use it. So the the most broad explanation is that you're looking at something from kind of a black box perspective, aka you don't have the source code, you don't fully understand how it works, and you're trying to figure out how you can use whatever ground truth fundamentals you might have about that target to learn more about it. So for example, when we're talking about software reverse engineering, you know that at the end of the day, this binary does have to run on some CPU, which means it's made up of some level of machine code. And that's why we start with you know disassembly. That's the first thing that we try to do. And then you can kind of build on those fundamentals if you know that it's a PE file for Windows. OK, well, now we know how to parse that PE header because that documentation is public. And we can use that to kind of assist in our analysis. Same thing goes for you know an ELF header or a U image or whatever you might be looking at. It's really the process of you know breaking some target, whether it's an arcade cabinet or an SSD, down to you know its fundamental components and then working backwards from there. So I think uh, one, one of the, now that you, you make me think about this, is one of the first boards, first uh, uh, single board computers that I ever worked with was called the Enforce 6410. So it had the Snapdragon uh, 410E chipset on there uh, from Qualcomm. And I remember um, this board, we got it, and there was no documentation, at least that we could find. And we were students, right? So like, I mean, this was like towards my earlier days, but there was no documentation that we could find that would tell us what the GPIO pin numbers were. Right. So like we could not go into the sys GPIO and toggle it up or toggle it down because we didn't know what the number was. And so we literally had to write a script. So we had to take it in, take it into our, uh, into one of our labs, right? Like put out a little voltage meter and then figure out basically write a script so it would just go zero one two three four five all the way into the hundreds until we found out what the number of the gpio pin was so that then we could bit bang it and do us use a stepper motor right like we didn't yeah. have the ability to do so we wanted to run a stepper motor we needed access to all these gpios and so that was reverse engineering right i mean because you're going from <laughs> you know you're just trying to fill some knowledge gap in order to achieve some particular goal and whether that goal is you know reflashing an arcade cabinet with new roms or learning how this board support package works maybe that you were given or yeah. you know you're given some hal driver and for whatever reason you know dma is not working properly well now we have to maybe disassemble try to decompile this thing to figure out what the heck's going on very cool very cool so i think the next one this is a little segue into here but we have how does one get into reverse engineering now i know like we've already kind of talked about it is like you may subtly be a reverse engineer or have done some reverse engineering in your career. But I guess the question is, how does one get into reverse engineering as a hobby versus is there a career path for reverse engineering? Totally. Yeah. So the hobbyist side is a lot of fun because the the way that you know, I try to tell people to get into it is, you know, find something in you that you maybe want to learn more about how it works, whether it's a piece of software on your machine, whether it's some, you know, embedded device you have on your desk. And, you know, depending on what that is, there's a lot of good resources out there online. So uh, earlier last year, I put together a Ghidra course with Hackaday that walks through how to perform, you know, software engineering or software reverse engineering kind of from stage one. And then on my personal blog, I have a bunch of examples of you've got some embedded device and you want to learn more about it. What are the steps that you take? And so I think what a lot of folks, you know, a lot of folks maybe get intimidated because you're looking at some PCB and it's covered in components and you don't know what they are. And it's really just the process of kind of breaking things down step by step, one component at a time 
and you know trying to look for data sheets maybe trying to figure out you know how these devices work and then kind of bringing that all together to accomplish some particular goal so one of my earliest reverse engineering projects that i can remember was some friends were all playing i think it was pokemon gold and silver on emulators in college so we all had like early revs of android phones and we were playing these games and i immediately remember thinking like i'm not going to spend time playing this game i'm going to see if i can patch this rom and just max out all my stats and you know not have to play this game so that i can actually beat these guys and so you know, as it turns out, I was not smart enough to Google if someone had done this first, because it turns out tons of people had already done it. But, you know, opening up that save file and tweaking bytes and seeing how that affected the Pokemon in your party or how it affected the state of your game, just things as simple as that are a good way to get started, right? I wasn't disassembling the ROM. I wasn't doing anything crazy. It's just, you know, modifying things and then see what, you know, what changes when you restart the save game. So having like a very narrow goal when you first start is important because it's easy to fall into like for example if we look back to like this pcb has all kinds of components on it if i tried to figure out how every single thing worked that would be the only thing i would get to do you know all year but instead if you sit down and say all right i'm going to figure out is there a uart console that i can get access to and if i can get access to it what can i do from there and again with like the end goal of maybe putting new roms onto it instead of just trying to dive in and reverse engineer every single thing so having a pointed goal is very important when you're getting started with it it's a long answer to a short question i apologize no it's great it's great and you know i want to focus a little bit on the pokemon side of things like i was big in pokemon red and blue and so me and my friends well me and one other friend he did the blue i did the red and so our goal was basically to get the pokemon that the other color couldn't get and yeah. then we would swap them right but then we found out that there was this dupe method when you hook in the cable that if you remove the cable at a certain time you can dupe the pokemon and so yeah, anyways, um, I did not go to the point where I, I said, hey, you know, what can I do to kind of maybe hack this or, 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 you know, try and figure out another way to get access to these Pokemon or upgrade them. I just ended up spending way too much time on that game. So um, probably shouldn't have. But I mean, I was like 12 or something. Uh, cool. All right. So um, I guess the last question here that I have with regards to kind of this high level description of reverse engineering um, is resources. So if, if people are looking to get, you know, involved in this more, to learn more about reverse engineering, you offer some courses. So can we maybe, you mentioned the Hackaday one. I posted it down there. We can post it again or talk about it again. But we have the Hackaday one. Um, and then you also have a paid course, right? Yeah, so I have a paid uh, hard, like hardware course that's focused around embedded systems. The, the goal with this is to take folks that have maybe, you know, they're familiar with you know, how computers work, maybe they're security researchers, maybe they're embedded developers trying to figure out how to harden their systems before they ship it out into the wild. And so with this course, what we do is we focus on those fundamentals that I talked about. So we focus on learning how, you know, a lot of the core embedded protocols work, how to identify them from a black box perspective, how to approach them as a reverse engineer. And then we take what we learn there and apply it to four different targets. So one of the targets is, let me grab it, this this travel router is one of the targets where we extract the firmware, get access to the UART console, patch the firmware in order to get us a root shell. Another target is this Carmen San Diego cabinet where we dump the save file and figure out how to patch it to make yourself the number one detective instead of who's there, kind of inspired by the first RE project that I ever did. And this covers, you know, I2C and Spy Flash. Another one is uh, an SSD example where we get JTAG working on an SSD and we set a breakpoint on a read operation and show that, you know, if we have hardware level debugging on this SSD CPU, you could change the data that's going over this thing on the fly. And you can imagine there's all kinds of applications for something like that. And then uh, finally, there's another module that focuses on, you know, serial wire debug and how to access that on, you know, Blackboard black box do, platforms excuse me do you ship the do you ship this hardware out to the people who sign up or do they have to get, uh, come across the hardware themselves and then sign up yeah so let me grab yeah, i do interesting Are you, so you provide the hardware because some of the hardware may i feel like might be hard to come by it looks, yeah know. so let me uh, i have a picture of it here let me switch to my top monitor for just a moment so this is a picture of the kit and all the targets Ooh. that are included wow, look at that. And so, yeah, this was uh, this was actually kind of a pet project when, you know, the first round of lockdowns hit. I'd had a lot of people reach out about the 
the blog posts and they wanted to know if I had, you know, a course available to make it interactive. And eventually I kind of had enough posts and enough example targets where the idea kind of came to me like, oh yeah, we could make this like a five day, like heavily interactive course. And so we ship out all the hardware and the students, you know, wire the stuff up themselves. There's wiring diagrams that are included. We walk through it all on discord. And then there are Jupyter notebooks with all the exercises that talk through, you know, exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it. And we, you know, walk through each target together over the course of five, you know, fun filled days. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. Is there any way, could you, could you pull that kit back up one more time? Yeah, I sure. want to like make you big here so people can see it yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah. So there you go. You can see that kit. That's pretty cool looking. Lots of hardware in there. And so, uh, you know, as, as uh, we had it displayed here, let me pull that back up. Here's the link to the paid course. Go check it out. Uh, voidstarsec.com forward slash hardware dash training. Um, you sign up for that course, you get access. I think it's like a five, you said a five day boot camp, right? It's a, yep. Yeah. So it's a five, yeah. Five day boot camp, and uh, you get this whole hardware setup. So pretty cool. Um, if you are intrigued or interested, definitely go check that out. So, yeah, let's bring, bring it back here. Now, um, if you have any questions, by the way, and I did not mention this, but if anyone has any questions for our guest here, Matthew, uh, please post them in the chat and we'll bring them to him immediately. Uh, now, the next section that I have here is about a particular project. So now we've covered, uh, you know, what is a, a, a reverse engineer. Uh, we've dove into a couple of cool examples. Where are some resources that people can get started? Let's talk about some of the cool stuff that you've done um, and walk through, you know, maybe what a reverse engineer would do for some of these things. So you have this one thing called hacking Hadoukens. Um, and for those of you who know what Hadouken is, Hadouken is one of the abilities that I think Ken and Ryu do on, yeah. on, Star, Star, <laughs> Star Fighter, on Street Fighter. Uh, so Hadouken is a uh, arcade console, right? Like a, like a... It is, yeah. So it's a, it's a reverse engineering project that uh, kind of came together that where I was given one of these uh, arcade cabinets as a gift. And I think I played it for about 30 seconds and then I opened it up to try to figure out how it worked. And so that's really what reverse engineering is, is being too patient or not patient enough to get good at games. It's really what it boils down to. So let's let's look at this. So you have a nice little presentation here. I want to remind everyone, if you have questions while he's going through this presentation, uh, please feel free to post them. But let's look at let's look at the process for reverse engineering the Hadoukens. Cool. Yeah. And, and those of you that want to follow along with the slides there, there was a link to the slides posted earlier. So if you want to bring these up on your own machine, they're on my my GitHub page as well. Put them in the chat too, right here, right now. Boom, done. So yeah, we'll just do a quick. Uh, we already gave an intro, so we can burn right through that. We'll talk about you know the platform, what the goals are with it. Again, when you're reverse engineering something, it's important to have kind of a streamlined goal in mind, so you don't get kind of lost in the weeds as you dive deeper. We'll talk about how to approach it from a hardware perspective, and what we can learn from that to then extract the firmware. Then we'll take a look at you know once we have the firmware. How do, you, how do we make heads or tails of it? Is it a custom image format? Is it something that we can parse with, you know, the usual tools we're used to working with? Or do we have to write something custom? And then we'll kind of wrap it up. And so, yeah, we've already gone through the introduction here. And so this whole point of this presentation is to give you folks a an example of how to, you know, perform a black box analysis of some embedded system. And in this example, we're going to be talking about an arcade cabinet, but it could be any other target that you might want to work on. And so we'll talk about, you know, how to extract spy flash memory. We'll talk about how to interact with the UART console using both using the Raspberry Pi. And so once we talk about those two things, we'll take a look at how to examine these firmware blobs when you extract them from some target, because it's, you know, you've got this binary blob that runs on this device and maybe you know the architecture and you might even know the operating system, but you still have, you know, a pretty big mountain to climb as far as figuring out what the, how it works. And so if we have time, we'll also take a look at how to use the tool uh, Katistruct to write you know, custom parsers for custom file systems. Because spoiler alert, this thing has a bespoke RTOS that I'd never heard of, as well as a custom file system that I'd never heard of. So overview about our target. Again, uh, we want to make sure that we keep you know, a clear view of what we're looking at and then also you know, what we want to do, what our end goal is. So when you know, I looked at this cabinet, the first thing that I saw was it's got a six button layout, which is a perfect layout for most main games. It also has an insert coin button and a start button, a menu button, etc. All these things that you would need to build the perfect like mini MAME machine, right? 
And so that's kind of where the genesis of this came from. This was, you know, kind of the perfect target to try to turn into a tiny generic MAME console. And so in order to do that, though, we've got a lot that we need to figure out. We need to figure out, you know, can we extract whatever storage medium is there? And, and why are we doing that? Because we want to see what firmware is on there presently. Can we patch it? Can we modify it? Can we change it to do the thing that we want to do? And so through doing that, we have to figure out what operating system is it running? What is the structure of you know, the applications that are running? How does it boot? What's the boot sequence? And you know, can we run custom programs? Can we overwrite the Street Fighter ROM with a different ROM? Or better yet, you know, load it up with multiple ROMs? So real, real quick, Matthew, I just want to, I just want to iterate here. I don't, I don't know if you said it, you may have, but MAME stands for multiple arcade machine emulator. So, yes. so, basically, so basically what you're trying to do here is take a, a console that only has one game and make it a multiple game console, right? Exactly. Like, okay, exactly. Perfect. Yeah. So I just wanted to, I, I, I didn't hear that. So I just wanted to make sure that I understood it. So I'll, I'll no. put you back in the big screen here. That's a that's a good example. Yeah. So the the end goal is to, to see if we can reflash it and also, you know, just to learn some stuff along the way. Right there. The fun thing about doing this kind of work is that it's it's rare that you'll run into something that maybe you haven't that you've seen everything before. So even if you can't get to your your end goal, you're still learning a lot along the way as far as maybe learning how to use a new tool or how to approach a new protocol. So reverse engineering is kind of you are consistently sometimes just failing at trying to do something, but then, you know, learning through that failure helps you streamline the process and then figure out how you need to approach these things in the future. And so the first thing that we're going to do with this is, you know, we're going to look at the hardware. We're going to take a look at whatever external interfaces we might be able to interact with. And so when we look at this system, we know that it has, if we were to look at it and on the manufacturer page, there's a three and a half millimeter headphone jack that's used to link two consoles together so you can play head to head. And then there's a USB charging port. And these are the only two externally facing peripherals that we have that we can really manipulate if we want to try to come up with some way for folks to maybe pull the firmware off without having to open up the cabinet. So this doesn't leave us with a massive attack surface, right? We don't have an ethernet port or anything that we might be able to try to get access to it or, or to scan to see if there are any ports open. We're kind of left with not a whole lot. We just have this USB port and the serial link. There's no data that comes over the serial link on startup. So we're gonna do a hardware teardown. So we're gonna crack this thing open and see what it has inside of it. And so when we do that, what are the kind of things that are important to us as reverse engineers, right? A lot of folks, when they when they look at a new PCB, you know, for example, we looked at the one on my desk here, you know, how do you know which of these components is important or that you should even care about? And we're going to talk about that now. We, we want to pay attention to, you know, processors, non-volatile flash devices, debug interfaces, and any other like silk screen information or headers that might be useful for us when we're first taking a look at this PCB. Because our, our goal here is to figure out how this thing works and if we can extract any data from it so that we can analyze it so that we can then try to patch it to then add a new game to this cabinet. And so the techniques that we're going to be walking through also apply to a ton of other use cases, right? Like a forensic use case where you just want to extract the data to analyze it. Or if you're trying to recover maybe a bricked dev board, these are all you know the same steps that you're going to end up doing. And uh, another side note here, when you're doing these kinds of hardware teardowns, make sure that you write down and document all the part numbers and components and take pictures just in case you remove a chip and maybe you forget how it was oriented when you first took the thing apart. And uh, it's also important to you know, search these part numbers for data sheets, see if you can find you know, any information that maybe sheds some more light on the target itself. And so if we tear this thing down, we've got three main PCBs that we'll take a look at. And so each of these serves a different purpose. We've got the top of the main PCB, the USB connector and serial connector, which is on a separate PCB. And then this is the back side of the, the main printed circuit board. So if we start by looking at this top PCB, this is probably going to be the one that we care about the most. And let me, let me move my, my, my face cam here. Get it out of the way so you guys can see the full PCB. So. The first thing that should stand out to you when you're looking at something like this, we do have this one component right in the center of the board. And if we look closely, we can see that most of the traces on the board are leading straight to this. And so this is a good indicator that this is probably the main CPU that we want to care about. And if we 
couldn't make that assumption, maybe if we couldn't see all the traces, another thing that we see hanging off of the CPU is an oscillator. And so again, this is indicative of, you know, something probably needing like a faster clock speed or some kind of external clock source. So a good indicator that this is probably our CPU. So this is the, the main thing that we want to pay attention to for now. This is our core CPU. We document it. And if we Google this part number, G20S, we can see that it is an all winner variant. Uh, it's one of the all winner ARM variants. But there's, there's more to this PCB, right? We've got these debug headers here, right? They're labeled. A couple of them have silk screens. And luckily enough, we have one here that's labeled ground and transmit, which is, you know, probably indicative of some kind of UART. And so even if this wasn't labeled for us, these would always be, these types of debug headers and, and vias like this are always a good starting point to see if, was there any kind of functionality left in for us to maybe take a look at as uh, REs? Matthew, real quick, um, I, I, I have to just say like, this is, this is awesome. I feel like kind of a detective, you know? Yeah. <laughs> this part in particular, you know, like you're actually saying, okay, well, these are the observations we have to make with regards to the traces and, you know, what these different components may look like. I'm curious, do you go over this in more depth, like in your course? Like, do you actually go through, like, is there a section that focuses on kind of identifying key components and, and things like this in your course? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we walk through, you know, different package types, what the different passive and active components are, what they look like. And then we do this process for every target that's in the course. So Very for cool. each target, we load it up and, you know, students take five or 10 minutes to look at it. And then we walk through it together and say, like, you know, what part number did you find for this? What did this tell you about, you know, how the thing, how it functions? And, and the detective notion is cool especially for those of you that have that are doing embedded development because a lot of this stuff will probably come naturally to you. You've looked at dev boards before, you're familiar with how they laid out. It's just a matter of kind of tweaking your perspective when you're looking at these things, right? You know that if you're talking to an EMMC chip, you don't want it to be very far away from the main CPU because of signal reflection and things like that. You know that, you know, you can pay attention to trace width to figure out what a trace is for. Is it wider probably for power? Is it, you know, are they paying attention to trace length? If so, probably a high speed interface of some sort where we want even trace length. So a lot of these topics are going to be things that embedded developers are already familiar with. They're just not used to look at it, looking at it from the finished product backwards. So yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you keep going. though. So one of these things that sticks out to us here, we've got one that's labeled ground and TX, which could be for transmit. And these are the kind of things that we want to pay attention to. But we've got, there's way more to this than just those headers, right? We can also see that we have a couple of different uh, integrated circuits here. But this one, if we Google this part number, this is a SPI flash chip. And if we look for part numbers for any of the other components on the board, none of these other components are used for any kind of non-volatile storage. So this immediately should make a light bulb go off where like, all right, this is probably where our firmware is being stored or whatever non-volatile data is being used by this particular target. And that's not to say there couldn't be internal flash on the CPU, right? But this is a good place for us to at least start because we can try to maybe extract the information from this flash chip. And if we look at our second board now, we know from the first board that we think we've identified the CPU, we've identified a flash chip and some debug headers. This is all very helpful and useful for us. If we look at this other board, we can see that they were nice enough to label every line of this connector on the silk screen. And so if you recall before, when we looked at the target, we were talking about the external interfaces and we mentioned that the USB was actually gonna be, we thought it was only used for charging, but let's put our engineer hats on for a minute and look at this connector. We can see that data minus and data plus are included on this connector. So we have DM, DP, and it's right near the USB connector. So why on earth would these folks include this data minus and data plus lines if it's only going to be used for charging? So this should this is already, you know, get your wheels are spinning and you're thinking, wait a minute, maybe there is some additional USB functionality that I'm not familiar with or that I am unaware of, right? That's not advertised on the main product. And the TX and RX are also good signs and the detect line are good signs as well. But these are what's used for debugging and linking the two two cabinets together. But the main takeaway here is that we thought USB was only for charging, but here we're seeing the data minus and data plus lines. And so it's a good indicator that it might be used for something else because you don't need those two lines if you're just going to do USB charging. 
for a simple device like this. Uh, Matt, Matthew, we have we have a couple questions coming in here. Yeah, um, sure. Maybe we can take them real quick. I don't know if you want to make your 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 face cam a little little. Bigger. Oh yeah, let me. Uh, fix so that. so number one comes in from Tyeth. Um, he's saying, how do you play it if there's no part numbers on the ancillary chips and a black blob on the CPU? Good question. So let's let's talk about that. Um, if we look, if we look at this target here, we have exactly that, right? So if we look at this, we have a big black blob over the CPU, and we have no part numbers except for one chip to the right. So again, we want to use those context clues that we were just talking about. So we can see that, you know, we obviously can't figure out the CPU part number, right? There's this big black epoxy blob over it, but we have an epoxy or we have a, an oscillator hanging off of it, which is good. And we also can start to kind of partition this PCB off into different regions, if you will, that are interesting. So if we look to the left, we've got, you know, these massive capacitors and what looks to be a reset switch and the battery lines here. This is a good indicator that this left side of the PCB is probably be being used for, for power management, right? So if our goal is to extract firmware, we can, we can ignore that for now, right? We're not super concerned with exactly how this thing manages power. But we also have these two SOP8 chips here on the board. Now, one of them has a part number and one of them does not. These are the two uh, rectangles here right near the CPU. So the next step would be since we don't have part numbers, we would tap these lines with a logic analyzer and see what the signals look like on startup. And so from there, we can start to see, is it I2C? Is it SPY? What are the logic levels? What can we figure out from there? And so that's why it's important to have this strong understanding of how these lower level protocols work, because sometimes that's all you're left with. And so we would tap the lines of any of the peripherals that we think it might be communicating with on startup, see what the signals look like, and then see what we can infer from there based on our you know, internal knowledge of these protocols. Great, yeah, so Tyeth, I hope that answers your question. I mean, I'm just more, I'm more curious, like, I don't know, did you mention this? Like, did they put, they put that black blob on there to prevent reverse engineers like you from identifying the chip? Is that the reason? That's a really good question. The that cabinet in particular, uh, that series of cabinets, that actually I have a couple blog posts on them on my on my personal blog. If folks are interested in the exact approach there, um, you know, sometimes the epoxy is used to make sure that it can't it can't uh, <laughs> for like stability to make sure that like solder joints don't come loose. In this case, I think it is mainly for IP theft because what's on those. Uh, boards are what are essentially called NOAX or N-O-A-C-S, which is NES on a chip. And it's literally an IC that's developed to emulate an NES. And they load what is essentially a NES ROM off that spy flash and, and run it. And so I'm not sure if it's for IP theft. I don't think it's for rever to thwart reverse engineers because none of the data on the flash was encrypted or anything like that. So we can just extract it with, uh, with flash ROM. So Excellent, excellent. So, uh, yeah, I have another question here that came in. And by the way, Ty says thanks. Very, very interesting. Thanks. Um, so, full detective mode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, uh, why, that's but, why it's fun. Yeah, exactly. So, here's another question. And this comes from iShot Jr. Um, so, in the first, he posted basically saying, "Have you have you hacked the multiplayer protocol?" And I asked for a little bit more specific meaning to that. And he's like, "Well, there's an audio jack that enables multiplayer." My question is whether Matt had a chance to play with that. For example, create an opponent via the audio playback. Um, oh yeah, so it's. I've looked at the I've looked at the protocol. I haven't quite figured it out yet. Also, we should shout uh, I shot uh, as well because he's the one that came up with the name hacking Hadokens. So massive shout oh, out cool. there. there you yeah. go. <laughs> I'm not clever enough to come up with that kind of stuff, but I've looked at the protocol, but I haven't quite figured it out yet. That's why. That's why earlier, and I had no idea why he posted this. But when we mentioned it for the first time, he's like, hmm, who came up with that name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Cool. All right. Well, no, I'll let you get back to it. Um, I know that there's still a lot of slides there. Um, there's one more section I wanted to cover. So I don't know if you want when a good time to kind of cut off on those slides is and then just let the, the folks here watching go and, and check it out on their own. Um, sure. Uh, for whenever you're ready. We have about 19 minutes left, so we can we can tap into the next section when you're ready. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll do. Let's do a few more minutes of these. We'll just walk through kind of the hardware rec reconnaissance 
portion of it. And then we'll talk about, you know, how the flash was actually accessed and then we'll, we'll take a look at some other stuff. So if we look at the underside of this PCB, there's not much, right? We have some labels on some of these test pads, which match up with what we saw on the previous PCB, right? We can see, you know, RXTX ground detect. We have all of that up here. That's, you know, nice for us. But again, nothing really new here that we don't have on the other side of the, there's nothing really enlightening here. We don't have any additional components or debug headers or even silk screen labels that are very useful. So from our quick hardware teardown, we know that it's got this G20 ARM SOC, it's got a spy flash chip and a potential debug header. So we're gonna focus on, you know, these two interfaces, UART and spy. And so we'll work through this pretty quickly so we can get to some of the other stuff. Uh, most of you are familiar or might be familiar with UART as a protocol. You know, this is a protocol that's designed to, you know, allow two components to communicate with one another. You've probably seen it before in, you know, use for debug consoles on home routers and things like that. If we hook up to the, we can hook this up to the Raspberry Pi because the Raspberry Pi has a built-in UART. And we can just try to hook up that RX line to the RX line of the Pi and see if we get any output that comes out. And we will use screen to then interact with that that console. Again, these slides are, are available online for folks that want to go through them slower. And if you have questions about any of the work, uh, please feel free to ping me on uh, on Twitter. But the long story short, if we access this with a baud rate of 115200, we are left with some wonderful debug info here. Right. And this is great because we didn't have any information about this target before. Right. We knew the part number. We knew the CPU, but we didn't know anything else. And as we dig through these debug headers, we learn a little more about the chip family. We learn more about what its capabilities are. And so there's all kinds of great data. There's some interesting strings in here uh, that, you know, EPOS memory debug. That's a uh, that's you know, interesting as a reverse engineer, anything involving, you know, adding more debugging and things like that. We also have another interesting line, FBA underscore open. And th so for those of you that aren't familiar, FBA is flashback alpha, which is an open source MAME emulator that we talked about before. And so this is, we're already getting a lot of good information here. We also have, you know, slash game slash Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition, you know, USA dot, or UA dot zip. And so we're, are, we're seeing things that line up with what we would expect, right? We're seeing that it's using some ported version of an emulator and it's loading a zip file that matches up with the game that we expect. And these are all, you know, the clues that we've put together as detectives in this scenario are starting to add up and we're seeing things that, that make sense. Um, so there's all kinds of information that we could pull from this UART. I don't want to dwell on this for too long. Uh, you folks have access to the slides. I think what I'd like to get to is we can use the Raspberry Pi to extract that spy flash. And this is just talking about serial peripheral interface, the pin usages, but we can connect this up to the Raspberry Pi and then use the flash ROM tool to extract the spy flash. And I have, this is what the clip would look like if you lay it down on top of the spy flash, you connect it up to the Raspberry Pi using this uh, pinout guide here. And then when you run the flash ROM command, we're able to get access to the firmware. And so I think at this point, I know we're running low on time. The slides are available online for folks to look at, but we can use the spy controller of the Pi to access the firmware. And once we extracted the firmware, we were able to pull out some components of interest like Binwalk, which is a common utility that you might see folks use when they're trying to reverse engineer, you know, unknown binaries. It found all the zip archives for the, the game ROMs, et cetera. But what really stuck out to me was that if we ran strings on this, we could see all kinds of strings for, you know, directory structures and directory entries. And more importantly, after looking at these strings in the binary headers here, we were able to ascertain that it was using, you know, one of these Sunsea chips, which have something called a FEL, F-E-L loader, which lets you interact with the device over USB. And so if you recall, we saw earlier that our USB connector had the data minus and data plus pins. So now things are starting to make a little more sense, right? We know that, you know, based on looking at the start of this flash dump that we pulled off with the Raspberry Pi, that this thing might have what's called a fell loader. And so what we found out was basically if you, and I'm just, I'm walking through these slides pretty quickly, I apologize. If you hold the volume down the volume down button on startup, this device presents itself similarly to the same way that a, 
uh, an Android handset would. So it presents this manufacturer device here, and you can then use the Sunsea Fell tools to extract the flash over USB and also reprogram the flash over USB. So now we have a way for anyone to, you know, hook up to one of these cabinets and dump the flash without even opening the cabinet, which is perfect for us. So this was all done by, you know, just reverse engineering the binaries, looking for clues in some of the, the more simple things, right? Just looking at the header, looking at, you know, various strings. It wasn't anything crazy complicated. We didn't necessarily have to disassemble anything. It's all about trying to piece together those few clues that we have you know, once we're able to pull a binary off of one of these platforms. And the slides dive into this in much more detail. And I'm also happy to answer questions about the slides in the work. But I think, you know, that's a pretty good spot, as good a spot as any to stop t with, the, with the slides. So I, I apologize if that went over. No, that's bit. good. That's good. I think, it's, I think it's awesome. I learned a lot, actually, I mean, in this short amount of time. So that's really cool. Uh, I wanted to just now, if, if we could, and just so everyone remembers, you know, Matthew is providing these slides. They're online. They're just available. So go check them out. Um, there they are. There's the link. We also posted it in the chat. Now, I have footage here of Matthew hacking Steel Mountain uh, with a Raspberry <laughs> Pi. <laughs> uh, so so there's the Raspberry Pi. There's Matthew. Oh, wow. Hacking Steel Mountain. Yeah. Um, Let's let's talk about Raspberry Pi as a hacking tool, um, not a Hollywood hacking tool. So that, that wasn't really Matthew. I'm just joking. Um, but the next segment here, that, <laughs> if you didn't catch that, that was from Mr. Robot. So in one of the episodes, you know, Mr. Robot, the, the kid brings in this Raspberry Pi, uses it to hack Steel Mountain for some reason. I won't spoil the show for you. But um, this segment is using the Raspberry Pi as a hardware hacking multi-tool. So what can you tell us, like just kind of kickstart this off, what, what is meant by using Raspberry Pi as a multi-hacking tool? Yeah, so I know a lot of folks, you know, are familiar with the Pi as kind of this, you know, embedded Linux board that we can use for things like you've probably seen people, you know, do all kinds of cool stuff with it um, because it's got all these various peripherals and things that, you know, you need to use, whether you're interfacing with, you know, a temperature sensor or what have you, like that's why this platform is so popular. It has all these interfaces, it runs Linux, it's user friendly, but we can also use all of these interfaces when we're reverse engineering some piece of hardware instead of interfacing with it. So if we, you know, if we take a look at the Pi and let me move some of these wires out of the way, you know, we've got a SPI interface, an I2C interface, a UART interface, we've got a ton of GPIOs. You know, we've got all kinds of things here at our disposal that we can use when we're reverse engineering an embedded system. So whether that's accessing a SPI flash like we did for the Street Fighter cabinet, accessing a UART, interfacing with an I2C EEPROM, interacting with a JTAG, you know, tap controller or a serial wire debug peripheral. You can do all of these from the Raspberry Pi. And you can do that by, you know, enabling the specific device trees for those peripherals in the slash boot directory. And so what I've kind of done to sort of streamline that is a, a couple of things. So I know a lot of folks, when they get a Raspberry Pi, the to, to engineers or folks that are, you know, familiar with the embedded space, I think the setup process can be relatively straightforward, right? They Sometimes they you just assume you have another monitor that you can hook it up to over HDMI and maybe an extra mouse and keyboard. That's one way to do it. Probably not the simplest way, right? It requires all that extra hardware. There's, you know, you have to modify some files in slash boot to maybe get it to connect to your network. Assuming you can connect it to a network, maybe you're at work and you can't do that for one reason or another. And so I, I think I've found myself in the past kind of turning away from boards like this because of that setup time, right? First, download the SD card image, flash it, do we have another monitor? Do we have another keyboard? You know, how do we get this thing set up? And, you know, again, to those of us that are familiar with this space, it's pretty straightforward. But if you're not very familiar with the space, it can be a little intimidating to, you know, plug this SD card in, you're, you're modifying these files on boot with no real sign of whether it's working or not. So I put together an image that uses the on the go controller for the Pi to present an Ethernet device over USB when the Pi starts up. So when you plug the Pi into your machine, an Ethernet interface is exposed, and then you statically assign an IP to that interface, and then you can immediately SSH into the Pi, or you can go to, and I have this here, a web interface that I put together for, you know, just kind of like an intro to, to hardware hacking on the Pi. And so for each protocol, we've got, you know, pages for if you find yourself looking at SPI, UART, I2C, JTAG, what have you. We've got pages 
for each of these, you know, tips for reverse engineers. And for the course material, we actually utilize Jupyter Notebooks to take advantage of all these different protocols. So for example, if you find yourself looking at an I2C flash chip, got a Jupyter Notebook here for you know, how to access these types of components. And here's an example of some of the wiring diagrams. And you know, these are some of the tools that we learned how to use. So for example, you know, I2C detect is a tool that enumerates an I2C bus and looks for available you know, I2C addresses. We can see it running right here. And it just, it gives you kind of an interactive window through which to learn about these protocols in a way that's a little less intimidating because you can do it all through your web browser. And if you're averse to a terminal, I've even got a, a web terminal configured that you can access. So the whole notion behind putting together this uh, this image was to make the pie as accessible as possible. Not that it isn't already, but just to make it even more so for those that, you know, maybe not be familiar with this. And so the pie has all of these interfaces, right? It's got a spy interface. It's got, you know, various UARTs, things like that. So for example, if we, let me go back to our terminal here. Um, I'm going to, let me make this a little larger. Let's take a look at the boot config.txt just so we can see like these device tree parameters that are loaded here. And, and this is also a thing that can be a little confusing to newcomers, but essentially we're configuring these device tree blobs such that we are enabling these various peripherals on the Pi, that being you know, SPY, UART, I2C, et cetera. And when we do that, we get entries for each of these peripherals in slash dev that we can then interact with, with you know, open source tools like flash ROM, I2C detect, I2C dump, screen. And so, by enabling these different device trees and enabling these different per peripherals, which there are lots of great resources on how to do, we now have this you know, multi-tool that can communicate with all these different interfaces, whether you want to do it in you know, Python or Go or what have you, you know, much like you talked about before with the Sys class GPIO, um, the SysFS work for GPIO lines, you can do that as well. So you're, you have all the power of these peripherals that you would have access to with an Arduino or a STEM32 or an, an FTDI, but you've also got you know, Linux under the hood that you can use to kind of augment what you're doing. So whether that's you know, writing a Python script to talk to a custom JTAG peripheral or writing a Python script to maybe first break into a U-boot console and then launch Flash ROM to, to dump the spy flash. There, you you kind of have the best of both worlds with this for a lot of your targets because you you have the power of Linux at your disposal, right? So you can configure and script and do everything you want. And then you also have, you know, all of these external peripherals that you can access. So for example, we're, we're connected right now to the UART of the Street Fighter cabinet. And so, you know, even right here from the Pi, if I wanted to inspect the traffic, I can do that you know, without having to get another piece of hardware and plug in and make sure that, you know, that was working properly. We have all of this, you know, that we can kind of get for free right there on the Pi. And again, I think folks think of it as a developer tool, which it is, it's a great developer tool, but it also has, you know, 90% of the peripherals that you need if you want to do this kind of embedded, you know, hardware hacking. So I think, you know, by turning on the appropriate, enabling the appropriate device trees and slash boot, and then making you know some of these protocols and their assorted tools, excuse me, a little more accessible through these Jupyter notebooks. You really kind of open up what's possible with the Pi. And you know, I'm not dropping this off in a uh, in a network closet necessarily, but uh, <laughs> this is, you know, it's it's become kind of my go-to for looking at a, a platform for the first time because whatever, like if you're putting together maybe a travel kit for for hardware hacking, this has you know, most of what you might run into, especially if you're working with like COTS, you know, IOT hardware and stuff like that. Yeah, so um, I mean, I, I wanna go back, by the way, excellent explanation, I think it was great. Um, and, you know, covered a lot, right? So, but I wanna go back to one of the first things you said is you, you, you said you developed an image or you, you, you have an image for the Raspberry Pi that, that this is similar to what you would do like with Raspbian, you, you flash this image onto an SD card, pop it in, boot it up, like that's, is that simple? Yeah, yeah, so I'm working on, I'm working on cleaning it up right now. And then the, the plan is to open source it with a series of blog entries about how to interact with all these peripherals. And so, yeah, the image is what lets you, so this particular image, it's based off of just regular old Raspbian. And we've, I've modified it such that, you know, on startup, it presents that ethernet interface 
So you just connect to it over using USB to Ethernet. You don't have to fuss with trying to put it on your own network. You don't have to grab a second monitor. And then, you know, you can... So it, let me... I'll hop into the VM really quick. If we just do... You know, we've got our USB 0 interface, which is our Raspberry Pi. And then if we SSH... And we can SSH into the Pi. This is all over USB. Nothing is on, you know, the home network. So if you find yourself in a place with no network, you can still just plug this thing into your machine. Your machine is also powering it. So it's just like one connection and you can SSH in. And now you've got access to, you know, your little external Linux system, which can talk spy, I2C, UART, can communicate with JTAG peripherals, what have you. And so I've found myself using this constantly after I put it together because again that that startup time can be so key with people getting frustrated with a with an RE project too right like if you're yeah. you can start to get frustrated with you know maybe you don't have the right tool or the right piece of software and it's easy to you know let the project die right there so 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 um I appreciate that Matthew um, we are kind of coming up on the top of the hour uh, I'd like to kind of respect, obviously, your time, but the, the time of our viewers as well. So I want to sure. make sure we try to close this off as, as you know, as close to top there as possible. We have two minutes left. So we have one question that came in from the community here from Tyeth. Uh, do you always protect the Pi input voltage-wise, or do you just measure logic levels first, assume basic on type? It's a good question. So the type. question here is basically you know, how do we make sure that we're not connecting up to something that might damage the IO pins of the Pi, right? If we if we were to connect this up to some, you know, five volt peripheral instead of a 3.3 volt peripheral. And so what I'll usually do is you look at it with the multimeter first, figure out, you know, what the range is, then try to take a look at it with the logic analyzer or a, a scope. And you don't need super expensive hardware to do this, right? You can use a, some of the cheaper scopes and analyzers so the analyzers, uh, there's a slew of them on Amazon that are that are less than thirty dollars, even less than twenty, and you can do you know basic analysis with that. So the workflow is usually you know multimeter first, then then the scope if you have one to analyze the signal, and then the logic analyzer, and then once you have that figured out, we can use this this logic level shifter here to shift between you know three point three on the Pi and whatever external interface we have for the the target. Cool, cool. So, Kaya, I hope that answers your question. And I was actually just about to type something out here for, for iShot JR. Um, he asked, if there's a course, or if I want to learn more about this stuff, is there a course or something I can attend? And, and iShot yeah. JR, we, we did talk about this, I think, a couple times already. Uh, but I do think it's worth it to mention it one more time before we close out. There are two courses, at least, that we've talked about during this session. Um, one is a free course. Uh, uh, I think you called it a, a, a Gaidra. Uh, Ghidra, yeah. So that's Ghidra. it's all software en reverse engineering. Cool. So if you want to get started with you know software reverse engineering, and you're not sure where to start. We we put all these lectures together to kind of give you a ground zero and up, you know, uh, approach for that. So and feel free to to ping me on Twitter if you have questions about it. Or the lectures are on YouTube, and yeah, people have responded very positively to it so far. So excellent. Yes. Yeah, so that's a free that's a free course. And yes at wrongbot on twitter so once we once we yep. kind of bring this down you'll see it pop up there but check check that out um and then here's a paid course that matthew offers as well uh so make sure you go check this one out also it's a five-day boot camp and you get a really cool hardware kit included with this shipped right to you so yep. matthew i don't know if you want to say a few things about this one before we close it up. Yeah, no so yeah the the kits all get shipped to you and then we do all of the lectures over discord and so Discord is nice because we're able to, you know, I'm able to stream the hardware view as well as a monitor view at the same time. We can have private discussions and private channels for each protocol. And the Discord channels stay active after the course. So if you find yourself working on this stuff and you have questions for the class or questions for me, you have a direct line to me through that as well. And so, yeah, all the hardware is shipped to the shipped to your door using, we use this Pi interface that I uh, demonstrated earlier. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. If you have any questions about that, please don't hesitate to you know reach out on Twitter. Excellent. And I'm going to do a little plug here because uh, you, you did mention Discord a few times. This is our official ARM software developers Discord server. So um, actually, you too, Matthew, if you're able to join the server there, uh, we'd yeah, love to sure. have you in there. And you know there is a show and tell, or yeah, I believe a show and tell channel. So you know if you do release new courses, especially obviously if they're if they involve ARM in any way, yeah. Um, you know, feel free to, to post those things in the show and tell channel, uh, get access to the developers in our server. Cool. Uh, James is thanking you uh, for the chat. Really interesting stuff. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I shot JR here. Sounds amazing. Taya, thanking you very much. Um, lots of, lots of, lots of good comments here. So we do appreciate cool. having you here last, but not least, I know we're one minute over, but Matthew, this is your chance. Shameless plug. Anything you'd like to say to our viewers before we close this out before I, I, I end it. No, uh, if anything, um, you know, if you learn stuff through the resources we posted, let me know on Twitter, but also, you know, take what you learn and, and make some resources yourself, right? That's how we, that's how we get people more interested in this stuff. And, and I learned through following blog posts when I was doing this stuff 10 years ago, and it's cool to, to be doing the same thing for other folks. So, you know, pay it forward in that regard, I guess. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. So, uh, definitely appreciate having you here, here, uh, having you here with us, Matthew. So, um, yeah, the slide deck is insane. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well documented. Matt, Matt is so brilliant at explaining this stuff. Oh, he dear. Getting so many compliments. <laughs> uh, what about me, guys? Come on. Like, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm like, what, what do you think, uh, you know, like my, my talk here, right? Anyways, yeah. Matthew, uh, appreciate having you. Your time, very valuable. Thank you so much for spending it with us. Everyone that's watching, I'm looking at the wrong camera here. Everyone that's watching, you know, gosh, can't thank you enough. We understand that you could spend this hour with anyone and you spend it with us. So that is, that means a lot to us. So thank you so much. Uh, Rob is an acceptable host. Thank you. All right. You all have a wonderful rest of your day, a wonderful rest of your week. Don't forget. We'll be back here next Thursday at 5 PM UTC every Thursday, 5 PM UTC. Matthew, thanks so much. We'll see you yeah. next time. All right. Thanks for having me. Okay. Take care. Hardware hacking, reverse engineering with, Wrong bod, Matthew Alt right here. Take care. Have a nice week. All right. See you guys.